welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we are speaking to global adventurer, Laura Bingham. She sailed the Atlantic in 2014, cycled 7,000 kilometers from Ecuador to Argentina with no money in 2016. She's currently pregnant while planning her next adventure. Hi, Laura. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. It's such an honor to get you on. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So, Laura, I I said like a few very brief bits of what you've done, say in the Atlantic, cycling 7,000 kilometers. Um, How would you describe yourself? I'm kind of a free spirit. I'm a Pisces and I'm really go with the flow type attitude, which some people don't appreciate in my family. Um, and I'm really determined as well. So if I set, say, so if I say I'm going to do something, I tend to always go and do it, regardless of whether people try and warn me off or not. Which was like with the Atlantic, I was living in Mexico, teaching English and doing jaguar conservation, and I was like, okay, I don't have enough money to fly home, so how am I going to get home? And I was like, right, okay, I'm going to sail the Atlantic. I'm just going to sail. And it took me about four hours to find this website that looked a bit reliable and to find a boat and all of this stuff. And I told my mum and she was like, no, no, I'll just buy your flight for you. And I was like, nope, I've made up my mind. I'm going to do it this way. And she's like, I'll, I'll pay for your flight. Just get on a flight. And I'm like, nope, I'm sailing. <laughs> Thank you very much. So after that, my parents and most of my friends knew that um, no matter what they said, it wouldn't really change my my ideas or whether I would do something or not. And they've kind of shut up a little bit since then obviously doing the cycling thing there was a lot of warnings against that but so let's just go back to your family then what was did you have brothers or sisters growing up yes I've got three sisters um they are nine years older 12 years older and 13 years older than me so they're 35 coming on 35 37 and 38 ish now so they're quite a bit older than me as I'm 24. So you're the baby of the family. Yeah, the little baby that always gets protected and molly coddled and all of those things. <laughs> were, you, were you adventurous when you were younger? Um, Not particularly. I was quite an arrogant, like, a bit of a spoiled brat growing up, I'd say. <laughs> well, my sister, sisters would definitely say that. But I've got family in South Africa. So we went out there from I was going out there from the age of six. And I went to school out there for a little for a little spell. Um, And I did like whitewater rafting when I was probably, I don't know, about 11, 12, 11, 12 ish and doing micro lighting. So slightly adventurous out there, but um, never particularly thrived in going out into the forest and building dens and stuff. I've read that you left home at 18 to go and travel. Is that true? Yeah. So it was um, like at college. It was college was a fun time, maybe a bit too fun. Um, and I was headed down a bit of a dark path because of family problems that had gone on. And at 18, I, was, I, I knew if I went to university, I'd just continue spiraling down. So I thought to go and travel and learn and experience something different would be a really healthy way of, of um getting out of the mold that I was slowly pushing myself into. Uh, So I left at 18 and then my mum sold our family home and moved into a flat so I couldn't move back home. (laughs) And and then just travelled, started travelling from 18. I went to Greece and then um, Belgium, South Africa, uh, Singapore, Bali, and then went back to England, did polo, like worked in polo, then worked in Madrid, doing au pairing and worked in Soda Grande doing more horse work and then I went over to America to do to work in jumping and then I, I landed up in Mexico so I kind of hopped around for about four years changing professions and changing um, countries until I found something that I really loved and that was four years later I realized I loved traveling and that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life <laughs> So when you were when you were eighteen, sort of going back to that time, and you decided actually you didn't want to go down the university route. You, you sort of wanted to get away and you know experience different cultures and and you know try something new. Mm-hmm. How easy was it to make that decision to go traveling? It was really hard because I was, you know, at college I 
I was quite anxious. I used to have to take like prochloramol, which is this thing that made me stop throwing up because like going out to the halls and going into the canteen would make me so anxious and so nervous that I would start throw, like reaching, which was even more embarrassing. So I became quite, um, for a period when I was sort of 17, eight, well, when I was 18, I was really, really anxious in in heavily populated situations. Um, so to go traveling, it was a huge step out of my comfort zone. Um, but it was the only option for me. It was the only thing that I could think of doing that was that was good for me. And I didn't go very far. I only went to Greece and it was only to work in a bar uh, for a couple of months. And it was the first time I'd lived on my own at 18, working on my own, living on my own, doing everything on my own. And But it wasn't so far away from home that if something went wrong, that I would be stuck there. So it was a really easy plane ride back home. And then once I got comfortable in Greece, it wasn't too much of a hop to go to Belgium and work in a pub in Belgium for a few months. And then from Belgium, when I got comfortable with the whole different languages, different people, different cultures, I then went to stay with family in South Africa for a while. And it just, every step got further and further away from, from home, the more comfortable I became with situations and scenarios. And the more comfortable that you got, did you also get less anxious at the same time? Oh, yeah, 100 percent. You know, when you're faced with a small problem or at that time seems a really big problem and you learn to overcome it and you learn that you're capable of overcoming that small but at the time big problem, it then gives you the confidence and the faith in yourself to then push yourself that little bit further and until the next problem arises. And you go, okay, I dealt with the last one. I can deal with this next little hurdle and so on and so forth until you realize that there's nothing that you can't do and that any problem or situation that life throws at you, you know, you've made it through all of these different things. This next thing is going to be piss easy. <laughs> when, when did that happen for you? Was there, was there like a certain point in time where suddenly you looked around and you realized, wow, like I'm doing this. There's nothing that I can't do. I don't feel anxious about it I'm just ready to take the next step I'm just loving it and you're just like completely in the zone yeah like I'd say from 18 up until Mexico when I was 21 21 I'd say I had like a broken heart like a broken hole a hole in my heart something that was missing this empty void and when I was sailing the Atlantic when I got back home that's when I just looked around and and went actually I'm okay I feel healed I feel fixed I feel good about myself and about life and I'm I'm really happy so it by all means was not a snap of the finger quick process it was a four-year journey through several different countries with them slowly getting harder and harder and harder but that day did come and I'm so thankful for it but it was um you know being in Mexico completely on my own without a job or a place to live and I had an apartment and a job within three days and really learning to listen to my gut and then also sailing the Atlantic when you're faced with these huge storms and there's nothing you can do but accept and try and work with the people around you to, to try and make the boat as stable as possible and well just going back to that you sort of said this empty void and this broken heart was it a broken heart that you were getting away from there were like several different layers that just added to not my misery but added to to my emotional problem from like family problems parents getting divorced and family histories and yeah being dumped and drug related issues and I don't know just like eating disorder type issues there were just so many different layers that weren't um weren't helping and that were just creating this really ugly void up until I was 18 and just decided to to get away and um it was a four-year process but I'm really really happy I loved what you said about Mexico being 21 years old arriving in Mexico a country you don't know and within three days you'd already sorted out your apartment and got your did you get your job in three days as well yeah yeah I found a school to teach at <laughs> um and I was literally just staying at a hostel and I, the reason I went to Mexico is because when I was living in London for a short spell I um, I was staying in a hostel so I could work and there was like a living situation when I 
when I had my heart broken for like the first time, I ended up having to stay in a hostel because of the living situation. And in that hostel, there was a Mexican chap and he called Saul. And he said, you know, you should come to Mexico and teach English. You know, English teachers are really well like sought after out there. Come and teach English. And it was when I was in Florida that I went, actually, I'm quite close to Mexico. Let's go to Mexico now. And I got to Mexico and, and emailed him and he said, oh, OK, I'll meet you at this hostel. You can stay there. So I stayed at this hostel and um, he took me to this English teaching school and I had an interview there. And yeah, I had a job within three days and this girl called Libby came into the hostel to say hi to everyone. And um, I was saying, oh, I plan on staying here for a while. And she went, oh, that's cool. There's a room that's just opened up in my like block where I'm living. You should contact the the landlord and see if he doesn't mind renting to you and I did and yeah and within three days I had a job and apartment and an apartment <laughs> what was it like living and working in Mexico it was the most incredible place that I've ever been and the people out there are so amazing and it's awful that it's got a generalized reputation as being a bad place obviously like I would never go to Chihuahua or Tijuana or across the Mexican border because that is a bit lawless and a bit crazy but I was living in Guadalajara which is the second largest sort of university city in Mexico I really I went there because I really wanted to learn Spanish and I did there were so many patient Mexican people I just walk around in the markets and try and strike up conversations with market people and they would just they'd appease me and they'd chat with me and listen to my awful broken Spanish and they would just be nice and they were like tramps on our street that he was there's one particular tramp that he'd just be smiling and happy and he'd wave at me every time I cycled past or walked past on, the, on my way to the bus stop. Um, yeah, it's definitely a place that I, I hold very close in my heart. So as well as teaching English, did you say that you're also doing a conservation work as well? Yeah, I made friends with this guy that owned a cafe uh, down the road and he taught me chess and he taught me how to learn. He taught me a bit of Spanish as well and he was overseeing a conservation project in um, near the coast of Mexico uh, so I went with him on occasion to do a bit of jaguar conservation work really which is going around and speaking to farmers and seeing where the jaguars have been located and it's funny because you get some farmers that are like yeah yeah I really want to help and you know save the jaguars and whilst they're talking you can see these gun shells around their feet and you're like uh-huh <laughs> so um and then trying to spot them and then putting up cameras and and then tranquilizing them and putting um, market, not markers, um, trackers on them so you can track their movements and work with the farmers so they um, they know where their cattle are safe. So it was, it was fun. It was, why did you decide to leave Mexico in the end? Because my visa was running out. I was there for four months and my visa was running out and it was just, it felt like time to go home and... I don't know, mainly because my visa was running out, I guess. <laughs> were, were you ready to go home? Did you want to go home? Yeah, I felt happy. I felt whole. I definitely knew that teaching wasn't for me. <laughs> After four months of teaching, I was like, yep, no, that's not the profession that I'm destined to be in. And I'm really thankful that over the course of four years, I tried about seven different professions. And I learned in a very short space of time that several different professions weren't for me. And teaching definitely wasn't one of those and I just thought okay I need a different profession I need to try something new I love Mexico but it's time for something new and um so I sailed back home and when I got home I was 21 and I thought okay it's time to find a career I need to find something that I'm good at that I need to develop and um the only thing that was constant in those four years was the traveling and I just thought if that's the thing that I love and I'm happiest doing, why not stick with it? Quick question then. How was your Spanish at the end? Well, obviously it it was good. I wouldn't say I'm advanced, but it, it was good. And obviously I then cycled across South America. So I learned a lot more there. And it's good enough that I can beg for food and, and be in a situation where I only speak Spanish for sort of a week or so. So I can have a point and try and get my point across. I usually successfully do that. So I, I guess I'm quite, I'm happy and I'm good with present, future, past, but it's the past, it's the future conditional and the past conditional that 
I need to work on. So the should have, could have, would have, those types of tenses. I've been trying to learn French and it's been going horrendously. I've got Duolingo. <laughs> oh my God, that's the one that I use. <laughs> that's the best app. That's like the best app. It, it's good. I, I do like all the little rewards and stuff in just like 10 minutes yeah. a day. I tried the Duolingo for French as well. And it's like, je mange une orange. And you're like, okay, <laughs> I say too. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I still love using Duolingo. I think it's the best language learning app. It, 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 they make it almost like more like a game than anything else, but it is really? um, it is good. Oh, I'm, I'm pleased if you, you use that for like your Spanish and your French. That's what I started out using. That I bought. I was well, you download it for free. Uh, so I used Duolingo. I got a Spanish grammar book, and then I literally just sat on the rooftop in my place in Mexico and just wrote out all of the conjugations of the of the verbs, and that's how I learned Spanish. I suppose just living in the culture as well, you just sort of, you're just absorbing it everywhere you yeah. go. Immersion is amazing. Yeah. So you did mention about your visas running out, you had to get home, you couldn't afford the flight home. So you decided next best thing would be to sail back across the Atlantic. So you said that you went on a website. Talk us through, you know, what were you looking for? Did you, did you know it was possible? Had you had any people like in the industry who said, oh, why don't you, why don't you hop on a yacht or something? Uh, no, I thought if I can't afford the plane, how else can I cross the Atlantic to get back home? And then I was like, okay, well, the next, uh, the next thing is a boat. So I looked at cargo ships and to get a cargo ship from, um, from Mexico to England, it was going to be about 1,200 pounds. So I was like, damn, if I can't afford the flight, I definitely can't afford that. Um, so I thought, okay, if I can't do that, I need to find a private boat, someone that doesn't really need paying. So I started looking at loads of different sailing sites and I ended up landing on a site called Crew Bay, which is basically where people advertise their voyages and people advertise their services. So I just looked for um, voyages that were about like were due to commence in the next month or so. And I ended up finding one. Unfortunately, it went from Orlando to England. So I had to get a flight to Orlando. So I had to leave the cow skull that I found in Mexico. So I couldn't take that. It was too difficult to carry. So yeah, I thought it'd be a bit dodgy going through the airport with a big cow skull and then crossing the ocean with it. But I kind of wish I'd brought it back. Where did you find the cow skull? Is there a story behind that? It was doing the Jaguar conservation stuff because we were just driving that, driving around loads of fields and like random places in Mexico. I ended up finding, if you look on my Instagram, there's a picture of me dancing on a plane. And I we just found this like derelict plane in the middle of this field. And I was like, okay, what do you do? You dance on it. <laughs> and yeah, I, I found a, this bull skull uh, that was skinless, brainless, just a skull. And I was like, that's so Mexican. I need that. You need that. I can't remember what it's called now. It's like gap year beads. <laughs> <laughs> But unfortunately, I left it at home and I really wish I hadn't. Next time you go back, I'm sure you'll be able to find another one. I hope so. <laughs> so you, you flew to Orlando. Who are you going to be sailing across with? Uh, a guy called Kai, who was the owner of the boat. And he was Swedish, 29 or something. And Gustav, who was like 30-year-old Swedish. Gustav ended up leaving in the Azores. And we had a guy called Jazz that came on the boat from another boat. Um, to sail to England. And I got to Orlando and I didn't actually have enough money to get from the train station to where the boat was. And I didn't even know where the boat was. I knew where the, I knew where the, like, the docking place was. I had the address of the place, but I didn't know where, I didn't know, I didn't have any money to get there for a taxi. So I was talking to everyone on the train and I was like, can, does, does anyone know where this is? Does anyone know how I can get there? Is it walkable? And then this little old lady was like, don't worry, my daughter will take you. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then she just kept chatting and she was like, you'll see, she'll be at the train station with a balloon, I bet. And then we got off and sure that there, there was her daughter and her husband with this balloon at this train station. And the daughter was like, no, her stuff isn't going to fit in the car. And the husband was like, yes, we will make it fit. I ended up like getting rammed into this car with these three American people who were so lovely and then we went to their house and they threw a barbecue they had a barbecue and I had lunch with them and then the the husband took me to the store to get a few things because he was like you, you're going to need some other stuff whilst you're sailing like more moisturizer and and stuff so he took me to this shop and paid for some stuff for me 
And then he gave me $50 on top of that for other stuff that I might need before we set sail, which is so kind. And he was telling me how he used to travel when he was young. And he was so thankful that he had the opportunity to give back to the traveling community and stuff. And he dropped me off at this boatyard um, and literally dropped me off with these people. And it, that's one of those scenarios that I was talking about that I had a problem, I had no idea how I was going to get from this train station to this boatyard that I didn't know where it was. And a solution just presents itself. It makes me think back to what you were saying earlier, you know, you used to have to take medication to stop you, you know, wanting to be sick when you're walking the hallways in college because you were mm. just so anxious. And then I can picture you on this train just talking to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly you've, you know, you've met this little old lady and that you know, her family, they're taking you for a barbecue, they're stocking you with items, giving you cash. And it is the kindness of strangers. It's absolutely absolutely amazing and had you sailed before you got on um before you what boat were you sailing on on the Atlantic we were sailing on a 38 foot trimaran with a cat uh, and I'd never sailed before what was it like sort of when suddenly you're on this boat leaving port not uh, just (gasps) heading off into the Atlantic I think the funny thing is that if you are I think with most adventurers if you ask them like what was your first thought when you left for this expedition or you left for this trip I swear it's always, especially for me, it's what the fuck have I done? (laughs) You're on a boat and I'm starting to feel seasick and it's been like half a day and I'm just like, what have I done? Was this really the best idea? And then after about two, three days, you kind of get used to whatever predicament you're in or whatever you've done to yourself. And you're like, yeah, this is okay. I'll learn something from it. I'm sure I'll be thankful in the end. And I was. Did you have like a certain a certain role on the boat that you had to do? Or it was just a case of everybody mixing in and just doing what needed to be done? It, it was a very small boat. Um, so it was just one cabin type thing and one little bathroom that you had to like manually flush. And the table went down to make a bed and you had one bed on the side, like raised up on the side, one bed raised up on the side. So the two guys were on the raised beds and I was on this push down table. And then kind of you just all pitch in. but. Well, I had to steer for two hours, sleep for four hours, steer for two hours, sleep for four hours, et cetera, et cetera, for two months. Um, So I never got more than four hours sleep in one spell, which isn't too bad because I'd always do the, what is it, the like eight to ten slots and then I'd sleep until two in the morning and then two till four because if I did the four till six slot, I'd always wake up, the sun would come up whilst I was steering, so I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep. But if I did the like a midnight slot, I'd always be able to get back to sleep. What was the most challenging aspect of this two-month trip on the Atlantic? The When you have an argument with someone on a boat, it's really annoying because you can't get away from them. You have an argument and you just sit on one side of the boat whilst they're sat on the other side of the boat and you're like, brilliant, I can't get away from you. Um, Did that happen then, often? A couple of times. A couple of times, yeah. I really, want, I really want to be nosy and find out what you were arguing about. <laughs> well, like, the captain said that I was the type of, uh, like, he took a fancying to me. And I obviously, I didn't have the same reciprocal feelings. And um, it was just, he said to me, you're the type of girl that would only ever go, to a, go for a really, really good looking guy or a really, really rich guy. And I'm neither one of those, so you'll never be with me. And I was like, that and you're also a bit of a penis. <laughs> So he kept getting drunk on rum, ironically enough, and um, going on these little rants. And I'm like, oh, I can't get away from you. So were you quite pleased when you saw Shaw? (laughs) Yeah, but then it was in Ireland. And I was like, I was like, but I said I was going to sail to England. I can't get off at Ireland and then fly back to England because I've said I'm going to sail to England. (laughs) So then I had to like stay on the boat again until England. But that was only another four days or so. So what did you think, what was sort of the highlight from that trip? Uh, The fin whale, seeing like loads of whale, well not loads of whale, I only saw a couple of fin whale, but they're the second largest whale, so they're huge, and seeing huge like 30 piece pod of dolphins, just playing with the boat and jumping around, and seeing all the bioluminescence in the water, just trailing behind the boat in its wake, and like the perfect starry night skies when everything's really calm. And I remember one day we were becalmed, so we were swimming in the sea 
with like ropes tied around us in case the the boat just caught wind and flew off and then like a few days later seeing a shark swim past and you're like oh uh I'm not going to be doing that again was it strange for you to be back in to be back in London again well I'm from the south so it I went back home to um actually my sister's because obviously my mum lived in a flat so she didn't have room so I went and stayed with my sister for a bit and I'm from the country so it was kind of nice just being back on land and in country again when did you get itchy feet or when did you decide oh god I I've got to go traveling again. I've got to do something. Whenever I was in England, uh, the itchy feet would start coming about two weeks after I landed. So quite soon it would be, okay, I need to go. I need to move. I need to get out of England and do something different. Um, But I never really had itchy feet to begin with at 18. It was literally a a case of I didn't like what my life represented at that point. So I had to change and do something different. Um, And then the itchy feet, I guess, started... I don't know, around South Africa, I'd say. It was it was more of a pursuit for happiness than itchy feet, I'd say. The next challenge that you did is one which I find it's just... I don't even know how... To, yeah, just to describe it, you know. It's, Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, cycling 7,000 kilometres from Ecuador to Argentina sounds awesome, sounds amazing. And, mm. I, and I get it, and I, and I think it would be a phenomenal trip. It's just the next bit. It's the with no money. Yeah, I didn't think that through. H- how did it even come about? <laughs> well, I thought everyone cycles South America, so I'm not being very different in that. How am I going to make it different? Um, so I went trawling through the internet as one does. And I landed on this organization called Operation South America, they look after young girls in Paraguay who's they come from broken or abused backgrounds who their family doesn't like from families who don't have enough money to feed them. Some of them are, are the product of rape for so many different reasons. These girls are in this organization. But one of the things that stuck out was that their families couldn't couldn't feed them. And, and this organization goes around and feeds about 70 different children in villages, uh, giving their families food for them. And I just thought I've never, I've never had that. I've never known what it was like to not have food. And the founder of this organization told me this story of these two girls that got to the organization and they physically didn't know that they were supposed to eat every day. Like they had breakfast and they were confused when it came to lunchtime and they were told that they were supposed to eat again because they were like, no, we, we eat every other day. Our, our dad comes home every other day and gives us food. And I was like, what? It just seemed like a really unfathomable thing. Like for us in a Western world, we'd run out of money traveling and we'd call our parents and they'd huff and they'd puff, but they'd, you know, put another hundred quid in our bank account or something. Or I don't know, I've just never been in such a predicament where I didn't know if or when I'd be able to eat. And I wanted to know what that felt like. I wanted to know what it felt like to be sort of a third of this world's nation like yeah I just want to know what it felt like so how did it start evolving then why did you pick South America to do this challenge with it was always going to be South America because I loved Mexico so much and I, I could already speak Spanish more or less so I thought I adore this culture I know that they're inherently good people and they are kind-hearted and I can speak the language so it was it was never a question of it being South America or, or somewhere else I mean, one of the things you said at the very start was when you talked about this challenge and adventure is people saying to you or the, the naysayers and people calling you stupid or you know other, other words. You must have got a lot of pushback on this. Did you get a lot of pushback on this? Yeah, a lot. And a lot of people saying how morally unacceptable it was going to a, a less economically developed country and expecting them to feed you. Um, that yeah it was morally unacceptable and I was silly for for thinking I could do it and for doing such a huge distance with no money and and all of that there was there's always pushback on sort of any idea you do that's more than going to the shops and back there's always someone that's going to be harsh um, with what they say about an idea that you've had so I just learned that I didn't really tell anyone until I had the 
the sort of scaffolding fixed and I knew roughly what I was doing. And then I told people and obviously all the blah, 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 they, that came. And you just kind of learn to ignore it. You, you listen and you take it in respectfully and you just have to brush it off and, and you just tend not to talk about it as much because as soon as you bring it up, someone's going to say something that's not very, you know, it's generally going to be a bit negative. So you just don't really talk about it as much. Yeah, I put um, I put a YouTube video up talking about my next challenge, the Appalachian Trail, doing it in 100 days. And somebody wrote this massive comment basically telling me all the reasons why I wouldn't be you able shouldn't. to do it. Mm. <laughs> you know, you're sort of sat there and if you're feeling a little bit low, you're just like, oh, mm. what, what am I doing? So I, was just, yeah. I think it sort of send you a little bit down. But building your scaffolding, getting that scaffolding in, in place to actually... I suppose that almost is that is that relating to your inner confidence, your inner self belief in yourself, and how do you build it? How do you have that belief in yourself that you can go out and travel this seven thousand kilometers through these countries with no money? Well, when I referred to the the scaffolding, I meant more like the nuts and the bolts of the expedition. Like you know where your route is, you know where your main food sources are going to be. And you sort of almost preemptively have all the answers to those negative questions already ready. So the people don't think that they've won up to you by asking a question that you don't know what the answer is. So that's the scaffolding I like to have in place before I do any trip. But the confidence and self-belief type scaffolding that you're referring to, it's just built over time. I don't think anyone is born with this scaffolding I think it's just doing smaller challenges until you you know build another brick or you put a piece in and you screw it in tight and then it's doing something slightly further slightly harder and just building upon that scaffolding until you've got this rigid structure that you know um sort of won't let you down so I can imagine the whole of this trip was hard I Mm -hmm. mean and I also think emotionally and mentally just incredibly draining almost like not knowing where you're going to get food from if you're going to eat what was the hardest bit for you or that hardest point was there a moment in time which really sticks in your memory Ecuador um Ecuador for me was the the hardest of all places because I can never I never know what you're allowed to call them like the indigenous people the native people the people of that country (laughs) they're not particularly fond of foreigners and I was told that by one of uh, an indigenous family or a native family uh, said that we don't want tourists in, in our country and we prefer them not to be here. And it's like, oh, OK, I feel really welcome now. Thank you. <laughs> but in the Ecuadorian Andes, that for me was the hardest point because no one was really giving. Well, no one really gave us food or hospitality and trying to convince someone to let me camp in their garden was a huge thing, let alone trying to get food or like a shower or water out of them um I had a guy spit on my feet when I asked him and I was like okay that's you could have just said no <laughs> and it was rainy and cold and it was a rainy season so from a cycling point of view it was really tough and from a social social point of view it was really tough but the whole expedition wasn't tough the end in Paraguay and Argentina couldn't have been easier or lovelier for me uh, I'm not sure my sisters would agree because they came out then, so it was quite new to them. But like Paraguay and Argentina, the people there were so lovely and so generous that it was sort of it was two weeks before I was due to be finishing the ex- the expedition, and I had to tell people to stop giving me food. So I was like, no, I, I physically I, I can't carry any more food. My bags are full, and I'm a, I'll be finishing in two weeks, so there's no point in you giving me food. So please stop. And they were like, no, no, just take it. And I'm like, well. This is so different. <laughs> I'm so thankful what happened in Ecuador happened because it really taught me the struggles and the shittiness of not having money and the emotional dark place that it puts you in. It's the worst place and having people not smile at you, not want you there, feeling like a burden the whole time is just horrible. And it took until Paraguay for me to not feel like a burden and for me to feel remotely good about myself again. It's weird because in Peru and a bit in Bolivia, the people were generous. They, you know, I'd go into restaurants and ask for the scraps of food off people's plates and they'd give them to me and they'd say, sit down. Yeah. And I'd go into restaurants in Peru and and they'd put the plate on 
on the table in front of me, but they wouldn't say anything and they wouldn't smile and they wouldn't interact with me. It really felt like a chore, that it was a chore for them, like, like they felt that they had to. So they'd put a plate of rice or, or like an egg and a rice in front of me and I'd eat it and I'd say thank you and, and all the pleasantries and leave, but I would leave feeling like a burden, like like really ashamed of myself. Um, whereas when I got to Paraguay, it almost seemed like a joy for them. Like people were toot, toot, tooting and waving and stopping and asking me if I was okay and if I needed water and if I, you know, if they, if they had biscuits or something in their car, they would give me biscuits and people were just really happy to see me. And that's when I really learned a valuable lesson of like the nicest, kindest thing you can do to a stranger is to smile at them. You know, if someone is begging on the streets, if you don't have any change, you don't have the time to look at your bag or like to see if there's anything you can give them, just smiling at them and registering that they're there is the kindest thing you can do. And the people that sell the big issues, just everyone walks past them like they're not there. No one really registers them as a human being. And that's the most hurtful thing um, that I found definitely whilst I was traveling is when people didn't smile at me or, you know, gave me food, but without smiling and I just felt really bad about myself do you think people understood what you were doing because I think it would be a case of almost they would see you a you know a white woman a, a you know a tourist or a site cycling traveling and generally people would well you know you'd be making assumptions that she's a tourist she's a white woman she's got money and then it's you're having to put yourself in this almost vulnerable situation yeah there was um there was a time in Peru that the church gave us a church gave us a bag of rice and a tin of tuna and we went around trying to find someone that would let us cook it and we ended up we asked literally everyone in this town and then eventually at this hostel this lady was like yeah 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 you can use my kitchen I was like oh thank god and she said okay well what room are you staying in are you staying with us and I was like oh no we're traveling without any money and we've got this food and you know, we're trying to find somewhere to cook it. And she just went, oh, um, actually, I've run out of gas. So no. And I was like, oh, that, that's a shame. OK, thank you anyway. Bye. And it was and I could see her kitchen and I could see that she was cooking. So I knew that she had gas and it was a blatant lie. But yeah, people just sort of, I think, saw me presumed that I was white and that I had money and I was a tourist. And they would be very kind up until they knew that I didn't. And then it would be like, oh, OK. But equally... I keep thinking that maybe that helped me in some scenarios. You know, maybe people saw me and thought, you know, she's interesting. Yeah, let's let her stay and talk to her. And she's only going to be staying the night because she's cycling. So she's not going to be staying with us for long. She's clearly privileged, so she probably won't steal anything. So let's help her for one night. Whereas if I was a, a real homeless person that smelt, that had dirt, well, I did smell and I did have dirt on me, but if I with someone that didn't have like any, a place to go, maybe they wouldn't have helped me. So maybe I got special treatment because I was white. Um, there's so many different questions and I don't think that I, I truly know what it's like to be homeless without money and in that situation because I wasn't someone that, well, I wasn't traveling without money and I wasn't homeless, but I don't know if I'm, ex I can't really explain it. I just, I don't know how true or how representative it was I know it was awful and I'd never, ever want to do it again. Did you have money? Did you have credit cards with you or cash on you? I had two credit cards on me, yeah, and with my passport in case of emergency. But other than that, no, I didn't. Did you ever have to use them? When Ed, my fiancé, he got hit by a truck and I had to use his credit card to pay for his hospital fee, his bill. So I don't technically count that as using money because it was kind of I wasn't not going to pay the hospital bill because I wasn't using money. So yeah, I used his card to pay his hospital bill. That sounds horrendous. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I cheated or and I don't feel too guilty about doing that because I wasn't going to let him suffer because I was like, no, I can't touch a credit card. What happened there? That must have been awful. It was awful, yeah. It was in Bolivia. We just got, we were 76 kilometers out of La Paz. And this lorry just drove too close to him and sideswiped him. And he went flying and he went all pale and he couldn't breathe. And 
it was just atrocious. And then people stopped and I was like, you know, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. And they were like, oh, there's a health center. And I was like, no, what's the number that you call if there's an emergency? And they were like, we don't have a number. There's no number. And I was like, what the, f- what do you do then? And they were like, there's a health center down the road. We'll take him to the health center. And I was like, he could have a ruptured spleen. His lungs could be burst. He could have internal bleeding. He could have spine damage, brain damage. He shouldn't be moving. An ambulance should come and they should lift him onto a gurney and take him to a hospital and x-ray him and check that everything's okay. And um, no, I know the health center's down the road. So they picked him up. So if he had a spinal problem, that would have made it incredibly awful and worse. And they put him in, in the back of this pickup and drove along this really, really bumpy path, which would have been jarring his back and... I could just hear him moan. I went into a car behind him, so I was following. And then we got to this health center, and there wasn't anyone there, so we had to call call the emergency number. And the person hung up on me. I was like, you know, my husband's just been hit by a truck. Please, can you come? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're on our way, and hung up. And I was like, what? Who's coming? Is it a doctor? Is it a nurse? How long are you going to be? What's the procedure? Like, what? talk to me. But they just hung up and wouldn't answer the phone again. About five, ten minutes later... The doctor arrived, gave him painkillers like morphine in the bum, and then put him in another four by four and drove him an hour to a hospital. So it was quite an ordeal just because the healthcare system out there is just so different. Did you want to go home at that point? Did you think, actually, we've we've done enough? Or why did you decide to carry on? Because I said I would. Because I said I go to Argentina. (laughs) Did you leave Ed there in the hospital or was he well enough to carry on? He was okay. They x-rayed him and everything was fine. He just had major bruising and a big gash on his back. We got a ride back to where he got hit by, back to the health centre. But our bikes and our tent and everything had been locked into the health centre. So we couldn't get any of our stuff. And this is about 11 o'clock at night now. Ed didn't even have shoes on. We didn't have any like coats and it gets cold at 3,000 metres above altitude in Bolivia at night time and we were walking around this little tiny deserted town with no well he had no shoes on with no coats with no with nothing and this lady ended up just taking us in until the morning until we could get our stuff back but then we had to get a ride back into La Paz and then Ness night came out and we hitchhiked back out of La Paz and cycled from where he got hit uh, my mouth my jaw is just open <laughs> yeah <I> was- <laughs> It was like, yeah, it's, it's scary, but you, it's one of those scenarios that you just, you have a problem, it's in front of you and, and you find a, you find a solution and it's all of those little problems and solutions that give you the confidence just to walk through life, knowing that you can handle anything that it throws at you. Absolutely. It must be nice having Ness come out. Mm, it was so much fun. We'd never met before. And it was literally, we commented on each other's photos and private messaged on Instagram a little bit. Um, And I was literally like, dude, I need someone to come out and cycle with me. I can't cycle alone because I'd previously been attacked in Peru, which was why Ed was out there in the first place. And I was like, if I can't have people out here cycling with me, I, I might have to go home. So please, can you come out? I need someone to come out for about 10 days. Can you do it? And she just went, give me 24 hours to rearrange some stuff and I was like okay and yeah like a few hours later she came back and went yeah okay what flight should I get what time should I be there and I was like yes so when you look back on on that trip I mean obviously lots of high points lots of low points lots of challenging points what what do you think you learned the most or what what stands out for you just the importance of smiling how difficult it is to live without money and how grateful we are, how grateful we should all be and how grateful I am that we have the abundance that we have here. Um, It took me about a month before I was able to go into supermarkets without crying, which is really embarrassing. Um, When I got home, we went to a supermarket and I picked up a bag of carrots and I just burst into tears. And then I went and I picked up a pot of like a a six pack of yogurts and then I burst into tears just because being able to have what you want and not have to beg for it and go through the emotional rigmarole of fear of rejection and not having to be scared to ask and just having 
it took me about a month to get over that before I stopped crying in supermarkets. That feeling you must have got, that feeling of accomplishment, that you've faced all of these fears, you've proved all your all the doubters, all the naysayers wrong. What was it like when you finished it and it was like over? It was, um, yeah, it was amazing. Started in Ecuador and I put my hand in the sea and I finished in Argentina and I put my hand in the mouth of this river that goes into the sea. It was sort of the the point where the sea started. Um, But the funny thing is that we got to the sea and the people had said, you know, to get to the sea, you then go down this little, you go around a corner, you go down a hill and then you'll see it in front of you. And so my sister went to the bottom of the hill and filmed me coming down. And the look on my face is really funny because I'm really overjoyed. And then I realized that in front of the sea, there's a whole strip of trees and then a barbed wire fence and a ditch. So I was like, I, I can't actually touch the sea. Okay, great. So now we just have to cycle five kilometers down the road until we can get to a patch where the sea is, um, which was quite funny. And then I dipped my hand in this cold load of water and overjoyed that I could just go to a hotel and not have to find somewhere to sleep. Um, was amazing and then we just ended up spending about three hours cycling through the capital of Argentina trying to find this hotel uh, whilst it was raining and it was like god's sake I just want to stop um but we got to the hotel and we went and had a McDonald's (laughs) (laughs) what would be on your bucket list then in terms of challenges that you could do in the world what would you like to do what what's sort of up there uh, I've got a bucket list and it's got 87 things on it and I'm slowly making my way through them but then it's generally just as soon as someone says I can't do something then I'm like right well now I have to do it which is why I want to do this next thing because someone said I couldn't do it so I was like mm, no I have to but I guess it's I hope to do this jungle thing in January and obviously the baby's due in June so it's just a, a case of seeing how the baby is, seeing how the political situation goes and just calling it when I see it. There's several different ideas in the pot and just waiting for the perfect time to arise to make hay with one of them. But the good thing is that like the TV stuff looks interesting. I'm talking to a production company at the moment and we've got a few TV concepts out there which are being one of them's with me and Ed and the baby. Um, It's sort of got a bit of traction with Channel 4. So hopefully that comes off and TV work will come in and you'll see me on Channel 4 instead. That would be amazing. So Laura, where can people find more information about you? Where's best for them to go on social media? Uh, Instagram, Laura, Laura Bingham 93 and my website and Twitter really. LauraBingham.org and what I'll do is I'll make sure I put all of the links on the show notes at Tough Girl Challenges. And Laura, what's your final words of advice for other women out there who want to take on a challenge or do an adventure? What would you say? The message that I advocate above everything is to follow your dreams. It's not necessarily to get outdoors and to you know, go walking in a field is to follow your dreams. And whether that's to read 100 books in a month or to work in a library or to open a coffee shop, whatever the dream you like, whatever dream you have is just to follow it and not be scared of what people are going to say, not be scared of whether you're going to fail or not, because the chances are you'll fail the first time and you'll probably fail the second time, but you'll learn so much from every single one of those failures that it just makes your success for the third time so much more rich and so much more amazing. Um, in the, the Imitation of Christ, it says, don't be mad for lessons learnt. And I think that's very true. I think if you make a mistake and you've learned something from it, it's a wonderful experience and you've done something good. If you make a mistake, don't learn from it and then make the mistake again, then you can be annoyed at yourself. But um, yeah, that's one of my favorite phrases. And also, God give me strength to change the things I can the courage to accept the things I cannot and the wisdom to tell the difference that's what I live my life by and there's also there's another great quote which I always want to want to end on on your website as well perseverance is the difference between those who make it and those who don't and that's to you yeah Yeah. Laura thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast and sharing more about your story best of luck with the baby best of luck with with the TV and your next challenge whatever it may be I have no doubt that you will make it happen (laughs) thank you so so much thank you for having me hey 
tribe i hope you enjoyed that episode with laura and if you are new to the podcast and you haven't heard the previous episode last week with ness knight then go and check that episode out so laura cycled with ness when they talk about bolivia and ness expands on that a little bit more so you can almost see the two perspectives of that challenge while cycling in south america just do want to say a massive thank you to everybody who has been listening, who has been subscribing, who has been leaving reviews in iTunes. It's absolutely fantastic and it makes such a massive difference. Now, people always ask me, Sarah, how do you fund the podcast? Um, You know, how do you monetize it? And I have these incredible supporters. I now have over 90 patrons who are financially supporting me every single month and you too can become a patron of the podcast from $5 a month to $10 a month. You can be part of this mission and you can help the podcast has to grow and develop. So I just want to take a moment to say a massive thank you to all of the patrons who have been supporting me. Kirsty Boyd, Kimberly Stinson, Leah Atherton, Rochelle Olsen, Dee Kaplinska, Caroline Wellingham. You ladies are absolutely fantastic. I couldn't do it without you. And it just makes such a massive difference having your support on board. If you want to become a patron of the Tough Girl podcast, then please do go check out Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And like I said before, you can donate from $5 a month to $10 a month to $15 a month, whatever it is that you can afford. At the moment, I'm currently out on the Appalachian Trail through hiking. 2,190 miles in 100 days. So that's going to be me averaging about 22 miles per day. That is the plan. You can follow along with my journey. So please do go check out my YouTube channel for more of my vlogs. But all of the information of past guests, on future guests that we have coming up can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go there and subscribe to the newsletter. Have a fantastic week, everybody. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl podcast.